on this episode of Cool Stuff, Cool Security. Staying safe in a world that's getting more dangerous by the minute. Today, the threat's much more sophisticated. Keeping one step ahead of the bad guys. Explosive materials, bombs. This x-ray technology really knows where the next hit's coming from. We'll get up close and personal with a biometric identification system that beats fingerprints hands down. Look in the mirror. The eyes don't lie. It's made it a lot faster. One look is all it takes. Now it's instant. I'll test my strength against some incredible body armor. It didn't puncture at all. And the coolest thing of all, it's actually a liquid, but it behaves like steel. And there is no hole whatsoever. Now that's smart security. <laughs> the world is full of cool stuff. I'm Steve Truitt. How come I'm not feeling any heat? And I want to know how it works. I'll be riding the leading edge of innovation, <laughs> pulling apart today's hottest technologies, and presenting them in ways you've never imagined. Join me on a journey into the hidden world of cool stuff. Seems we can't go anywhere now without being quizzed, scanned, or photographed. But in some places, maximum security is not just a precaution, it's a necessity. In prisons across America, identifying inmates has gone way beyond stenciled numbers on striped shirts. We need to be confident we have the right people coming in and going out of maximum security. Okay, left, go ahead and open your eye really wide, look in the mirror. And now biometrics, unique body measurements, are giving us that certainty. No one can fool this iris scan. Iris recognition is far more accurate than any other biometric, including fingerprints, facial recognition, and other forms of biometric identification. That's because your iris, the colored ring around your pupil, is an intricate and unique kaleidoscope of tissue that doesn't change after puberty. No one has your iris pattern. In fact, you don't even have the same pattern in both eyes. If you consider the iris itself, it's one of the most unique structures of the human body. If we were to compare your left and your right iris, for instance, there's one chance in 10 to the 70th power that they would match. So not only do you have one unique iris, you have two unique IVDs. It's impossible to change the structure of your iris unless you damage it. So the chances of fooling an iris recognition system are almost zero. Hey, Cadillac, step over here. But to be sure you have the right match, you need an extremely accurate profile. Go ahead and open your eye really wide, look in the mirror. This digital camera starts the process. Two quick snapshots and officers capture a prisoner's identity. Hey, Cadillac, go ahead and have a seat in room nine. The images only need to be black and white because it's the iris structure, not its color, that's unique. A small infrared light enhances the detail by eliminating reflections from the cornea. Once the images are captured, some smart mathematics takes over in the form of software analysis. That digital image is then processed by an algorithm called the Dogman 2 pi algorithm which is basically a mathematical process converting the digital image into a binary template. This algorithm, or mathematical formula, calculates points of difference in the image. It's recording relationships between many tiny features. The more points, the more uniqueness and the greater the certainty. Iris Scan uses 200 points of difference, just to be sure. These points are then converted into a digital template that's unique to each iris. That template is then stored. At a later time, when we capture an image with this camera or one of our other cameras again, that new template is compared with an entire database of templates and the correct one is matched. Now, inside a prison, it's not just accuracy that matters, it's the time it takes officers to verify they have the right inmate. With iris scan technology, that's less than 10 seconds. It's made it a lot faster, especially before if somebody wouldn't 
give us their real identification, we would have to fingerprint them and wait for it usually an extended period of time, 30 to 40 minutes, to find out who someone was. Now it's instant. There's no waiting and no doubt. And come release day, no mistakes. When someone comes into the jail and is booked into the system, we capture their Irish patterns. When they're ready to be released, they can be absolutely certain they're releasing the right person. Turning our eyes into digital IDs may take a bit of getting used to, but when you want certainty, eyes will never lie. We saw how Iris Scan helps prison officers to be sure they have their man. But they face another problem every day, the risk of attack. Despite the best security, inmates still end up with weapons they make on their own, and they're lethal. Probably one of our most dangerous ones is possession of a ruler. Inmates were able to fashion them basically into uh, shanks, they're known as. You make the wrong move, and uh, uh, if you're not watching out, they can uh, attack you enough to, enough to kill you. You might wonder why officers don't use military-style armor. One reason is they need to be free to react in emergencies. Body armor would just slow them down and make them even more vulnerable to assault. But here at the Materials Research Laboratory of the U.S. Army, they may have the answer. Lightweight clothing that's absolutely stab-proof. And the secret isn't the fabric. It's this stuff, armor in a bottle. Flexible materials like Kevlar are great at stopping bullets, but surprisingly, it's almost useless stopping a knife. So uh, this is four layers of fabric. And this is a type of fabric you'd use in body armor, mm -hmm. police vests, even army vests. What I want you to do is take a little swing and go ahead and try to pop through that fabric. Okay. Not too big, not too hard? It, it, it went right through, didn't it? Okay, and if you look. This Kevlar isn't gonna save a prison officer from a shanking. Okay, now this looks like a cool experiment. Where are we? To see why, this Eric's put the Kevlar swatch under a microscope. So that's pretty good in that's focus. Good. You can see how the spike pushes around the tough fibers. It just slides right between them. So no matter how tough the fibers are, a sharp blade can just slip through. What just we moved did, it to the side. Moved it to the side. Okay. They call that windowing sometimes. It's kind of like making a window. Right. And there's something sharp and pointy can go in between okay. the fibers. That makes sense. Right. See how far things Stretching. are getting stretched and moved out of the way? So, fiber strength means zip when it comes to a shank. Just stab, uh, but this add area. some right liquid there. armor to fill the gaps. Really give it a good one? And it's a different story. Give it another one. Give it another one. <laughs> I'm going lefty. <laughs> it didn't puncture at all. I mean, it made a dent, but it didn't puncture. No, it would hurt pretty bad, but you're not going to have a spike going through your vital organs, which right. is probably better for you. This super strong goo is called sheer thickening fluid. OK, so how did you make this? Well, this actually has two parts in it. It's a liquid and a solid combined. So the liquid is this thing here. It's called polyethylene glycol. It's a polymeric liquid, very safe. It's kind of like antifreeze, but you could actually eat it. But you combine this with a solid phase, which right. in this case is a powder. It's silica powder, so silica right. is glass. Right. Um, but it's very special the way we combine yeah. these. This that you have in your hand right. was actually this amount of liquid mixed with this amount of powder. So how does this stuff work? The billions of silica nanoparticles, more than 100 times finer than human hair, mix easily and evenly in the glycol. In a liquid state, the particles have a weak molecular surface charge so they don't clump together to form a solid. But when an object impacts the liquid, it changes radically. The object's kinetic energy forces the particles together and they lock in a lattice with strong chemical bonds called a hydrocluster. The liquid becomes as hard as ceramic for a split second. 
Then when the kinetic energy is spent, the bonds release and the solution becomes liquid again. It's truly amazing. So I want you to push in there real slowly with that rod. And well, what you're going to see is there's not much resistance. It's kind of like a liquid. No, it's going down to the bottom smoothly. OK. But if you yank in a big hurry on it, <laughs> yeah. it will not let go. So once you stop pushing on it, it'll kind of go back to liquid again. It would fall off that spoon and come out again. When I apply strong kinetic energy, there's no way I can push through. As soon as I stop pushing, the silicon particles let go. Tough as ceramic, but still a liquid, which means it soaks right into the woven Kevlar. This fluid is crammed in between all the little tiny filaments in this fabric. You yeah. see a little excess you know, at the intersections, but it's really, really in there. We're looking through the microscope again. This time, I'm trying to pierce some treated Kevlar. Yeah, the fabric's moving, but there's no windowing. There's no separation of the fabric. All it cares about is that you're pushing on it in some way. In this case, right now, you can feel, feel how tight it's that taut. is. Yeah, and you can see it's pushing it in. That's right. So things are getting squeezed in there. Even though it's not shearing, it's under stress. It still looks like fabric. Remember before, those yarns were getting pushed Stretched and out. pulled, and it looks like somebody took a yarn and started yanking on yeah. things, took the fabric. Here, everything is still pretty, in, pretty much intact. So it's a big improvement on the raw fibers. But this technology is meant to save real lives in a tough world. And most hardcore prisoners pack a far bigger punch than I do. I'm going lefty. I didn't have much luck. <laughs> it didn't puncture at all. I mean, it made a dent, but it didn't puncture. But what about a brutal stab from a big bad guy? This thing here, I want you to kind of squeeze it. Well, I can't find one here in the Army's materials research lab, so we're going to drop this stainless steel spike from eight feet. That's equivalent to a blow from someone weighing 230 pounds. Now, at that height, that's a pretty good stab. So that's a big, yeah. strong person on a good day, but people can stab that hard. All right. 289, three, four, five. There it is. Three, two, one. And it did. It bent. Wow, it really bent. Even a massive blow like this doesn't make it all the way through. The shield of clumped silica particles held strong. And there is no hole whatsoever. The powerful kinetic energy made the silica particles lock tight into a ceramic barrier. OK. OK, I'm impressed. But how big a blow can this stuff really handle? Now, remember, I promised you something a little special. Don't kid yourself. This hunting bow is no toy. It'll produce uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 175 feet per second. Right. Um, it's aluminum arrow, feather fledged, and it has 125 grain bullet field tip. Okay. In other words, this is a serious weapon. It could kill a bear at 20 paces. Be careful of the ricochet. First, I want to see what it does to untreated Kevlar. Shot. How far was it? I think about 68 inches. Yeah. Now let's see what happens to a vest impregnated with liquid armor. Couldn't get through this. <laughs> well, we do lots and lots Remember, of Remember, this is a steel-tipped hunting arrow traveling at 170 feet a second. Our high-speed camera reveals something incredible. The arrow bounces right off. <laughs> ah, here it is. On the floor, not in there at all. all right. So probably what happens, that tip of the arrow, remember, it's, it's pointy. Right. It started to poke through, but just couldn't find its way all the way through, right. bounced off, and came back. In this case, the uh, shear thickening fluid is holding those fibers in place, won't allow them to slide out of the way keeps the, uh, the arrow from getting all the way through. Right. And Eric has other applications in mind for this amazing goo. Just imagine what treated gloves could mean for rescue and healthcare workers. No more needle sticks from dirty syringes. So for example, police officers 
Often when they search somebody, they gotta search their pockets. Even sanitation workers picking up garbage, nobody wants to get stuck with needles. So there's a need for needle protective uh, materials. But getting lightweight, stab-proof uniforms into the prison system is still Eric's priority. These guards risk lethal attack every day, and liquid armor is life-saving technology. There's always that threat. If that threat exists and there's an, an item out there that can uh, protect us, absolutely. As long as it's uh, you know, somewhat lightweight, something you can move around in. Air travel used to be a soft target for terrorists and smugglers. But now we know better, and we're spending billions of dollars on airport security to keep a step ahead of the bad guys. Of course, there are still vulnerabilities. Take the standard transmission x-ray machine used to screen for weapons. It can catch metal objects, but that's about it. We now live in a world of liquid explosives and ceramic weapons, obscure designer drugs, and human smuggling. The problem with these new threats is that their chemical structure isn't even vaguely metallic. It's organic. And that means they're almost invisible to regular machines. We need something new, and now we've got it. It's called the backscatter. The types of technology at airport checkpoints now were originally deployed to help defeat hijacking threats when people would try to get on board planes with guns or knives and commandeer them and take them to other locations. Today, the threat's much more sophisticated. Okay, now let's open our bag up To again. prove the power of this new technology, let's compare it to traditional security. Joe scans a typical carry-on briefcase with a regular x-ray machine. We have some articles of clothing here in the top. And here's some typical items. Uh, power supply for a laptop computer, a portable radio with a cassette player. There's also an umbrella, an electric toothbrush, and a cell phone. It's all typical, all metallic, and easily picked up by standard x-ray technology. Here's our umbrella down here. Here's our power supply for our laptop computer. This image also reveals a handgun that was concealed in the bag. And so, again, this image is very good at finding kind of dense objects that may be concealed in this bag, such as that handgun. But there's so much more hidden inside the suitcase. Dangerous things that aren't made from metal. Now, check out what the new backscatter reveals. There are three organic threats here. The first, easy to pick out, is a composite handgun that's designed specifically to uh, be hard or impossible to detect in a transmission x-ray image. In addition to that, we have this organic item, which is an explosive, and the explosive simulant is concealed by the cell phone. You can see the outline of the cell phone. It's the same as we showed in the transmission image. Finally, there's a bottle here, which contains liquid explosive components. This item is concealed in our transmission x-ray by our laptop power supply cord. Pretty amazing. So what's going on here? The new technology still uses x-rays. It's just how it reads them that makes the difference. Normal machines simply capture straight x-rays, either passing through or being blocked by objects. But the backscatter looks at x-rays that are diffracted or scattered off in different directions. These scattered rays hold a lot of information because different materials scatter photons in different ways. Organic elements like hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon can be identified by their unique scatter pattern. And with some computer analysis, the pattern turns into an image, showing up as clearly as metal. Another advantage is that this technique can be used on a grand scale. Seaports are another soft target that backscatter technology hopes to toughen up. Shipping containers can be Trojan horses for weapons, contraband, even human trafficking. But this Z portal is the airport system on steroids. You can run whole containers, trucks, or vehicles through it. In just 30 seconds, it can scan a car from three different angles. You can see the images start to reveal on the screen. 
and we've got a top-down view and a passenger side view of the vehicle as well as a right side view of the vehicle. With backscatter technology, there are no secrets. So for example, in our top-down view, you can see there's actually a stowaway that's concealed in the trunk of this vehicle. You can also see all the way through the roof of the vehicle, down through the back seat of the vehicle here. And you can see there are items that have been concealed underneath the seat. You can also see threats that have been concealed in the side of the vehicle. Here, here's another uh, simulant for cigarettes. This machine is a big improvement in technology. Technology is catching up with the bad guys and giving us some pretty cool security. Detecting deadly threats, capturing the right person every time, and protecting our protectors. I'm going lefty. See you next time on Cool Stuff.